But if your schedule is full of things you wouldn't do if you weren't being paid for it, then you really need to take a hard look at your life. Mm. And if that's the case, it better be that you're doing those things to make money that allows you to do other things that are deeply important to you. Because if you're just doing it to do it, you are wasting the thing that we have zero control over, which is time. Time's gonna pass no matter what you do. It's not a commodity. And once it's gone, it's gone. The only thing you have control over is what activities you are busy doing as that time passes. I don't know about you, but I want to be doing things that are purposeful for as much of that time as possible. Mm. And That's, you found hospice then. Huh. How does somebody find that purpose that you call almost mission? I'm sure you've heard that the the story about the the three workers. You heard that one where there's like the first one, they ask, Hey, what are you, some guy walks by and they're all working on something. He's like, what are you doing? He's like, Oh, I'm moving bricks. And the second guy's like, well, what are you doing? He's like, I'm, I'm building a church. And the third guy's like, I'm working for God. And it's like, you know, it's the same, same they're all doing the same thing, but they each have a different purpose of why they're like, how do you find your, your deeper purpose uh, with what you should be doing with your life? So this is one of my favorite questions. And to do it, I'll I'll talk for a moment about the life review, which is something we do in hospice. Mm. But before I even get there, The truth is, I think most people have an inkling of what their purpose is. They're just too afraid and they don't have the courage to pursue it. Mm. So here are a few simple ways to think about what purpose means in your life above and beyond doing a full life review. One is what caught your attention when you were a kid? Like kids before society tells them they have to make lots of money before their parents tell them they have to be a doctor or a firefighter or a pro NBA player, whatever it is, kids have an innate idea of what lights them up. But somehow we lose that over time. Mm. So think about your childhood and what lit you up then. That's one way. Two, look at your job. You hate your job. Find the one thing about your job you do like. For me, that was hospice. But usually there's something in your job you like and then start asking your question, why do I like this? What is it about doing this thing that I like that takes this job, which otherwise is horrendous, but I ignore doing other things because I want to spend more time doing this part? When was the last time you woke up in the middle of the night and couldn't fall back asleep because you had a big, crazy idea? It happens to all of us. Yeah. We all have this. What generally happens? Well, you, you go to bed late at night. You wake up the next morning tired. You've got work and you forget about it and you mm-hmm. never think about it again. But these are those kind of whisperings of what's important to us. What if you pursued that idea as silly and outrageous as it was? What if you learned about it? What if you found other people who did stuff like that? And then one other thing I guess I should also mention is lastly, if you have no other idea, you use the spaghetti method. You throw a bunch of spaghetti up against the wall and see (laughs) what sticks, right? So you say yes to things you normally wouldn't do. Like... I normally wouldn't get on a plane to come to Maui to be interviewed for a podcast. On the other hand, being here, walking these beautiful beaches, swimming with Alex, (laughs) going to an undisclosed place, doing (laughs) undisclosed things which we can't talk about last (laughs) night. We signed an NDA. (laughs) True. All of that looks a hell of a lot like purpose to me. Mm. And I wouldn't have even thought of doing it unless I just started trying things that scared me, that were insecure yeah. and unknown. So after yeah, doing all so that, you can do something called the life review. Life review. And that's something you do in hospice, you said. Let's, it is. Let's talk about that. It is a structured series of questions that a doctor or a nurse or a social worker or a chaplain can sit down with someone who's dying And it helps them look at their life and talk about those important things. Like what were their goals? What did they accomplish? What did they fail to accomplish? Who are those important people in their life? What do they still hope to accomplish now that they know they're dying? Mm. It's a way of putting your life in perspective. And it also allows us to start thinking about what are some of those regrets? Like what are those kind of things that we really wanted to do that we didn't do? And when you look at this under the lens of I could be dying, It allows you to let go of societal norms. It allows you to let go of all those things people told you you should be. And for once in life, you can just look at your naked thoughts and needs. And so that is a boon to the dying. The question is, why don't the living take Mm. advantage of the same boon? Why aren't we doing these life reviews at a much earlier age? Not when we're dying, but when we're at a crux in our life or when we're starting our new job or when we just got that big bonus and we realize we have a little more money in the market than we thought we had after we buy our fourth door and realize that the money coming in can pay for my monthly needs. 
why aren't we doing these life reviews and saying, it's time to think about what's really important to me. That's really good. And in your book, I know you had a uh, you have a practice in here. Uh, I don't know what page it's on, but where you you give the questions that people can actually do and take time out of their day to go do it. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to doing that because yeah, it's something that we don't look at enough. We don't. So let me let me pivot that a little bit. As a hospice doctor, you know, there's that famous book about the top five regrets of the dying. For anywhere. Yeah. What have you though, as a doctor, seen as the biggest regrets of those who are dying? Generally, it all boils down to the fact that they never, they always regret that they never had the energy, courage, or time to do something that was deeply important to them. Mm, so it's, that never, purpose it's never one thing specifically because individuals are different. Yeah. So we get excited by different things. But ultimately, when you talk to people who are dying, you realize that there was something they wanted to do that they just never got around to. Or a person that was important to them that they never mended an argument a hobby that just lit them up and they let go and never returned to. I mean, each person, it's different. But the regret is that they didn't have the courage to pursue it. And, you know, a key point here is the regret is never that they failed. Because mm. people go and fail things all the time. It's the whole arena speech, right? Yeah. We've all heard the arena speech. Yeah. The regret is that you didn't get in the arena and fight the valiant fight. Yeah. Not whether you succeeded or failed. In fact, a lot of times people's fondest memories are right when they were in the arena, sweating it out, bleeding on their knees, and yet still fighting. I love that perspective. You know, there's there, there's a thought often that says like, you know, will I, you know, five years from now, will I regret, well, let's even go more simple. Am I going to regret going to the gym later today? No one ever regrets going to the gym. They regret not going to the gym. And so I use that same methodology when I say like, will I regret not taking that trip. Uh, and sometimes it says, no, I, I would not regret not taking that trip. I would regret missing my kids because I took that trip, right? So that question of, will I regret this? And we can't always have perfect clarity, but I find that super as a, a super helpful framework in my life to say, should I do this thing or should I not do this thing? Should I pursue it? And most of the time, yeah, I, I would regret not taking the opportunities unless it takes away another more important opportunity that's valuable to me. And I'd remind people, like, we talk about bucket list items and people are like, I regret that I didn't pick the, take that big trip to Europe. Yeah. Those things are not nearly as enduring as the regrets about living how you wanted to live. Mm, can you explain that more? Well, when we think about taking the trip to Europe, let's say, what we're really saying is we wanted to spend time with those important people or we wanted to get out of our environment and see different things or we wanted to contemplate how another portion of the world lives. What I often stress to people is to look at the deeper reasons and not the bucket list item itself because mm. usually it's the deeper reasons you're not going to make it to every country you want to make it to or most people don't you're not going to actually tick off every bucket list yeah. item but if you're really thoughtful about it you can live a life of purpose that made you want to do those things yeah that's really good yeah because you won't like you your bucket list like, I'm curious your thoughts on the bucket list. I like the idea of, of having that, like, I want to go to England or I want to go to see the pyramids. And I've got lists like that around. But there's this book, is it called 40,000 Weeks? Oliver Berkman, is that his name? Do you yeah, know yeah, the book yeah. I'm talking yep, about? Is yep, it 40,000 yep. Weeks or 40 something? How many you get with your family? Uh, sort of, but it's it's not, it's about like, I think it's the, the name comes from like how many hours of like life you have or something like that. It's Oliver, Oliver Berkman. See if you can look like that up. 40,000 hours or something. Yeah, something like that. See if you can yeah. look that up. Oliver Berkman's, yeah, Alex is going to look it up real quick. Uh, wow, I feel like Joe Rogan. <laughs> hey, Google that real quick. Uh, 4,000 weeks. 4,000 weeks. Uh, time management for mortals, right? Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, he makes this amazing point in there. He said, if you were to think about all the things that are cool in this world and then realize you will not do point zero zero one percent of them i have a book in my house called a thousand places to see before you die it's this great coffee table book and then i open it up to like hawaii like the section of hawaii and there's like one thing in hawaii that's worth that's on the list of a thousand things to do there are a thousand things in kihei that are mind-blowing that i want people to do here's the problem with bucket lists yeah it's very goal and destination focused yes Happiness comes from purpose and process. Mm. Happiness comes from being engaged in as much of your limited time as possible doing things that are important to you. It's not based on a goal or destination. So when you start looking at bucket lists, what you're really talking about is all or nothing, win or lose. Yeah. I either made it there and did that thing or I didn't. 
And what I don't like about those things is they are eminently failable. Mm. And so people get anxiety about purpose, yep. right? One of the reasons they get anxiety about purpose is they go after things that are goal oriented. I, I love goals and I, you know, writing a book was a goal for me. There's nothing wrong with that, but you wanna base most of your purpose and happiness in things that you enjoy the process doing because you can't fail. Mm. It's not all or nothing, it's all and all.